Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show, where we help you make the wisest and most profitable decisions. My name is Dr. Gleb Zapurski. I'm the CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts, the future of work consultancy that sponsors the Wise Decision Maker Show. And today with me is Kelly. Kelly, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your company and what it does? Sure. Um, my name is Kelly Scheib. I am the Chief People Officer at Crunchbase. Crunchbase is an AI powered platform for discovering and connecting with companies that are driving innovation. Um, our best in class data helps you find opportunities at companies that matter, whether you're an investor, a salesperson, an entrepreneur, or a job seeker. Excellent. And tell me a little bit more about the kind of work arrangement that you have at Crunchbase in terms of remote work, hybrid work. What do you do? Yeah, so Crunchbase would consider themselves remote first. Mm -hmm. um, now, I'm going to define that because there's a million different definitions mm -hmm. relates to remote work. Yeah. Um, I think that's probably one of the big problems with the debate. Um, we would consider ourselves remote first. We do have two offices one headquartered in the Silicon Valley in San Francisco, mm -hmm. um, and that is an office employees have the optionality to go into if mm -hmm. they're based near that office. Um, it's certainly up to them, completely up to them whether or not they choose to use that. And then we have a WeWork space in New York City. Um, again, just a landing pad um, intended to be used as needed by employees. There's certainly no mandate that anyone uses mm -hmm. them, but some people choose to. Now, tell me a little bit about how you decided to adopt this arrangement. What motivated you to do so? So this all happened before me. So I can't say I take ultra credit for it, um, but I love it and I'm grateful that it was that it happened. Um, so this change for Crunchbase happened at the same time that it happened for most companies was during the pandemic. Um, employees um, in California and San Francisco specifically were asked to shelter in place probably before the rest of the country was, yeah. if I recall correctly, um, I believe right around March 16th, 2020. I remember the date because I was leading a Silicon Valley company at that time as well. Mm -hmm. um, I could have the dates wrong. But um, and, and, you know, I think that what happened at Crunchbase happened with a lot of organizations. Mm -hmm. Employees went home. They started working remotely. And it worked and it worked so well. Employees were happier. They had optionality to, ne to not necessarily be tied to a specific location. Um, and we saw that optionality only amplify with our ability to hire remotely as mm -hmm. well. Um, that in and of itself provides flexibility, so much flexibility in location, but also flexibility in the talent that you're able to attract to your business at the same time. So it worked and they decided to make it a permanent, um, a permanent fixture in the country based story. Excellent. Now, a number of companies, so I helped 25 organizations by now figure out their hybrid and remote work model. And one of the challenges that they face and a number of other companies face that decided to go back to the office is dealing with junior staff, mentoring them, onboarding them. So Salesforce, for example, was saying that it will be a fully flexible company, but eventually Martin Benioff decided to go back to the office because he said he found data that junior staff tend to underperform when they're hired remotely, onboarded remotely, and he's worried about the continuity of the company, even though well, more well-established staff are doing fine and productive. And I definitely saw that in a number of my clients, and we have to deal with that problem. And there are a number of ways of dealing with that problem. So I'm curious what Crunchbase did or does to deal with those sorts of issues. I think data is a funny thing now, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, I, we don't see those issues necessarily oh. in Crunchbase. I will tell mm -hmm. you that I... I do believe that just like there are issues with fully in person, there are also issues with fully remote, right? Mm -hmm. I, I would not say that one is superior to the other. Mm -hmm. I think that with anything that you do, whatever model that you choose to prescribe to, intentionality with how you manage mm -hmm. through your challenges is key, Right. So if you can acknowledge that some of your more junior level employees are having more challenging time onboarding, you're very intentional with how you show up mm -hmm. for them. 
programming, right? So just be it through mentorship programs, be it through the way you're communicating with them. Many of the things that we already have in place at Crunchbase, I wouldn't say that we've seen a large issue at all in our more junior staff. We've you know, had a lot hired lots of junior staff um, since the onset of fully remote work. Um, I do think that our approach works right now because it is very intentional in the way mm -hmm. we communicate and the way we show up for our team members. Okay. Yeah. It sounds like you do mentoring. You, it sounds, so maybe we'll talk a little bit, bit more about that because at a number of companies that decided that a number of my clients that decided to have that more flexible model, they had to institute really in-depth mentoring programs. So mentoring programs with someone from your own team to help you understand how the team works and do your job, someone mm -hmm. from another person, mentor from across the organization to help you build those connections across the organization, which are harder to build when you're remote and you don't run into people in the hallways. So that person focuses on helping the mentee build connections and network across the organization. So those are some examples of mentoring programs that have been effective for my clients. I'm curious what you do what crunch base, what kind of mentoring do you do? How, what does it mean to show up for those junior staff? Yeah, it's iterative, I would say. I would mm -hmm. say that there isn't certainly a silver bullet approach. I would say that we're constantly refining what we do. We have a mentoring program, a mentoring program that started before remote <laughs> um, happened. Um, and generally, it can be functional mentoring. It can be cross-functional mentoring. Um, in addition to that, we have defined rules of engagement for how we're going to communicate, how we're going to measure performance, how we're going to collaborate. We also have what we like to call it crunch base. We have bases throughout the United mm -hmm. States of America, and you live in one of the bases. Mm -hmm. um, and that's intended to create collaboration and opportunities mm -hmm. to connect with employees. They started as nodes, but we expanded them just recently because, as I said, all of this is iterative, right? All mm -hmm. of it is iterative. Yeah. Um, and as HR should be, right? You should always mm -hmm. be looking to level up your game. Um, and so, you know, those are additional opportunities for connection. Um, we also mm -hmm that at times in person matters right and we make space for that within our organization which means that we may have you know on sites once or twice a year there may be team get togethers once or twice a year depending on the need for the team um, one of the things that Crunchbase does that I actually think is unique to most is we have a very very transparent organization mm -hmm. and we're together as a business, all of us together as a business weekly on weekly town halls. Okay. Um, very unique. Um, most mm -hmm. organizations have quarterly town halls. I came from yeah. an organization that only did hound town halls right before the earnings report or right after mm -hmm. the earnings report. Um, that's certainly not the way it works at Crunchbase. Every mm -hmm. employee is um, asked to join a weekly meeting where we're all together. Those are just some of the things mm -hmm. we do. I could list a million different things that we do, but um, and always, always trying to iterate on it to ensure that we're doing right by our employees. Excellent. Well, let's talk about another issue that I've observed in remote first companies. And Microsoft research shows that reported that 87% of managers have difficulty trusting that their team members are productive when they're working remotely. And that issue of trust in productivity and performance is a big challenge because managers have not been trained to effectively manage remote folks. So what do you do to help address those trust issues that managers often have in remote workers? Yeah, I mean, I think that we certainly operate from a position of best intentioned employees. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think that starting, I think if you start the conversation by, I'm not going to trust my people, you're going to mm -hmm. have to earn my trust. You've already failed mm -hmm. um, as an employer. I certainly think that we, um, we come at it well-intentioned as an organization. That's certainly what our, I, what I believe our managers do. And then we measure performance according to, we utilize an OKR system, which is very 
very trendy in the tech yeah. world yeah. Um, and our employees are measured accordingly. If you can mm-hmm. live to those standards that are set and the goals mm-hmm. that are established with you and collaboration with you, mm-hmm. um, then you're being productive. I think it comes down to how you're measuring productivity and mm-hmm. the more traditional view is you measure productivity for how long you're sitting in a seat. I yeah. don't necessarily think that that is that works anymore. That is a traditional mindset. Mm -hmm. Um, And while I certainly understand why it's come to be, um, it's antiquated at this point. You shouldn't be measuring productivity by how warm your seat is at the end of the day. It's definitely antiquated. And you're absolutely right that it's in a, even before the pandemic, we knew that this was not a good idea. (laughs) And it's really- The reality is that company employees have been dispersed forever, right? Mm -hmm. So employees, despite the fact that you may have been centrally located in one location, chances are you were working with a different factory or a different location. And there were people in different locations. And I, and and somehow we were able to manage and trust them, right? Mm -hmm. I've worked in human resources my entire career, and I've had team members dispersed along across the entire United States, even when I was in person. Um, at a location, right? Because we had different factories and different locations. Um, and I trusted them just fine. Um, so I think that, I think we're putting a lot of emphasis on they're at home, so they must not be working or they're at the coffee shop, so they must not be working. Um, it's it's a very traditionalist opinion. It is traditionalist opinion, but of course, many people in leadership positions are traditionalists. They have gotten to where they were by working in the office. And they are, many are in their 50s and 60s. They are that at that stage, it's hard for them to change their minds. So, what do you say? What would you say to these traditionalist folks to help encourage them to be more open to a flexible approach to work? You know, I think. I don't think I would say anything. I think that Mm -hmm. people talk, people, people talk with their feet. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think at the end of the day, even being a traditionalist, you're going to want to be able to recruit talent. Mm -hmm. You're going to want to be able to retain talent. You're going to want to know that your team members aren't sitting in your office all day long looking for a new job. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think that if people are willing to walk, people are willing to, you know, speak with their feet, Mm -hmm. that's what changes minds. I, I, I firmly believe that this, and this is the topic of my dissertation, is I firmly believe that the reason that we're even having this debate is because leaders are approaching this as a tactical problem to solve, when in reality, Mm -hmm. this is transformative and adaptive change Mm -hmm. that they have to be willing to lean into. If they're unwilling to lean into it, they lose. Right. And they will lose in the long run. They may not lose in the short run. Right. Because this is still new, Um, but they will lose in the long run. They will. I was just reading an article this morning about an investment company that is encouraging its clients to incorporate work from home policy into its investment decision making. So it's evaluating work from home policy and one of the two there are two crucial aspects of work from home policy that it's considering the extent of buy-in from employers into from employees into the work from home policy of the employer so not the specific policy itself but the extent to which it has employee support and then the extent to which it's clear to employees and of course it's very rare that a five days a week mandate actually has employee support so it will generally be some kind of the if you want employee support it's going to be a flexible model of some sort and so i'm think we're it looks like we're seeing more and more investors actually evaluating this question and it's not simply going to be hurting companies in the long term but perhaps in the shorter term of where investment is going not simply where employees are going well i think that if you start to see that all of a sudden there will be a new revolution and we're Mm -hmm. Remote work will be trendy again. Um, I actually think that's really fascinating. And I think the most fascinating part of what that data shows 
or -hmm. what that article says is that a leader is willing to think differently. Mm -hmm. Um, And that, that is a gift. That is what you want in leadership, especially innovative leadership, probably looking for funding. Um, Mm -hmm. They're willing to think differently about the problem at hand and they're willing to be more adaptive and transformational in the way they think. I mean, we only Mm -hmm. got where we are based on some transformative change, right? I mean, if you date yeah. back to the way work was um, decades ago, centuries ago, it's it's all been an evolution to, to where we are today and it all required transformative change. Indeed, indeed. Now, as we wrap up, what is your vision of the future? What do you think the future will look like with remote work, hybrid work, what do you think that will happen? I think the pendulum will continue to swing back and forth. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that, you know, I've, I've said this from the beginning, unfortunately, I do believe this is a bit of a power game. And mm-hmm. I think when employees are in a position of power, you'll see remote work amplify. And when employees mm-hmm. are not necessarily in a position of power, they're not necessarily right now in some instances, sure. um, you see the employer amplify. And we're going to end up right around the middle, right? I think you will have employees that want to be fully remote and they mm-hmm. will go see organizations that are fully remote. I think you'll have employees that want to be in office and they'll seek out positions that are in office. I think you'll, you'll have employees that are hybrid and desire that. And they'll seek out those types of positions. And I think that the goal and where we'll end up is kind of you get to pick your journey Mm -hmm. and just like you get to pick your organization, just like you get to pick your location, um, employees will get to pick and employers will get to pick kind of what works for Mm -hmm. them. Um, And the reality is, I think that from where I'm sitting, it's easy to make a decision on remote first because we can all be remote first. I think where it's a lot more challenging is when you have a subset of the population that has that is by nature a role required to be in office. It's much more challenging when you're in that position to kind of draw us, you know, to put a stake in the ground and say, this is the model we're going to have because it doesn't necessarily translate to every employee. Well, actually, I was, uh, funnily enough, I was interviewing, uh, another CHRO yesterday of a company, logistics company, that does have some people in the office, but the corporate staff are remote first. So it's definitely doable. And there are some companies that do it. Mm -hmm. Certainly doable. And you certainly shouldn't discount or throw away the baby with bathwater, as I said, Mm -hmm. Um, simply because you do have Um, you do have some in-person staff that's required to be in person, but that is where I see the majority of the noise, quite frankly. Um, Mm -hmm. I see the majority of the noise coming from organizations that are having a hard time justifying fairness Mm -hmm. um, in, you know, that I worked in manufacturing for the large majority of my career, and it was very Mm -hmm. hard to justify fairness when your manufacturing team that's building your product has to be present Um, and the supply chain employer, the engineer does not necessarily need to be present to do the function of their job. There are ways to do that. Well, um, I've done it well, um, but it requires full scale leadership support and adaptability. You really do need to bring everyone to the table to solve for it. It shouldn't be something that is, um, it shouldn't be something that is in any way, an edict that comes from any every, any high level of the organization. Absolutely. It requires support from everyone and understanding of, you know, that why would you want to torture the corporate staff and bring them to the office if they don't have to, right? The commute, you know, it's based in San Francisco, commute there is over an hour to the office and over an hour back. If you don't have to do that, then you, everyone's better off if you can dedicate some of the money that you would need to spend on their salaries and commuting benefits to go to getting giving community benefits to the people who do have to be there in person. So there are definitely ways of addressing this and having those conversations and making it fair. Yeah, I think that there are certainly ways. And I think that, you know, jobs are inherently different and that doesn't necessarily mean they're right or wrong. And people choose different jobs for different seasons of their mm-hmm. life, right? So for instance, you know, in 
20 years when I have no children at home and it's just my husband and I staring at each other, I'm probably not necessarily going to want to be in a fully remote environment. Hmm. Um, but maybe, who knows? But I do think people make seasonal decisions based on the the plate their place in life and i think that as as employers we should be there for them if we want that talent in our organization excellent <laughs> funnily enough i was talking to a client of mine just yesterday and she said that because it's the summer and she's spending a lot of time her kids house is full of kids she actually wants to get out more and she's spending more time in the office whereas during the school year she spends more time working remotely <laughs> I spent a lot more time at coffee shops when my kids were home in the summer than I do now and they're at school all day. So, um, but you know what? I think that flexibility and the optionality, I think it's about choice. I think it's about employee choice and, and it is, it never, it, I, I'm never not grateful for the optionality um, to make choice. And I think that, that is, you know, that's engaging. And that's a great place to wrap up. Thank you for very much for your time, Kelly, and your expertise. Thank you. And thank you to the audience for checking out another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show. Please make sure to subscribe wherever you checked out the show and leave a review. It helps others discover the show and helps us improve the show. All right, everyone. I'll see you in the next episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show. In the meantime, the wisest and most profitable decisions to you, my friends. <laughs>